first Friday, and also the beginning of our young adult gathering this Labor Day weekend. And uh, we'll be here in uh, Kentucky when the Father's Holy goes to men. We are in a great battle, and at the end of the fight, on Good Friday, the soldiers, before they went home, they were told to verify that they were dead. Because the word had been come out that the Lord Jesus Christ had died, and there was a concern because normally in a crucifixion, in a crucifixion it takes about three days to die. One reason for this is that the rule of the Romans was not to scourge or crown with thorns anyone who was going to be crucified, but they would only be nailed to the cross and nailed tight to the cross so that they would very slowly asphyxiate, very slowly stop being able to breathe, and after three days they would die. St. Andrew hung on the cross for more than three days. St. Peter was only a short time on the cross because he was crucified upside down. So it was a surprise to Pilate when the word came that Jesus Christ was already dead. Even though he had forgotten so quickly a few minor details. He forgot so quickly what he had done that morning. How he had our Lord Jesus Christ scourged and crowned with thorns, almost to the point of death. He'd been beaten by his soldiers. He'd been dragged through six different trials previously beaten by the Jews beforehand, had begun with a bloody sweat before he began that whole battle, and it was a miracle that he even stayed alive to be crucified. He forgot. Only a few hours after he had seen Jesus Christ and said, Ecce homo, behold the man. And what did he say at that time, Ecce homo, behold the man? He said, look at the man whom, you, uh, uh, whom I am calling your king. Look at that man. But when he said, look at that man, ecce homo, behold the man, ecce rex vester, behold your king. I, the head of the Romans, am going to say this man is your king. It's interesting that in our present time in the crucifixion of the church, we are hearing pilots throughout the world repeating the words of Pilate 2,000 years ago. In Poland, they say uh, that last year they are going to say that Jesus Christ is the, is the sacred heart of the king of Poland. We have our own king here in, in America, Donald Trump. And a few days ago, what does he say? The first time in the history of our country, the Ave Maria was sung in the presence of the president. One Hail Mary. And the president shortly before that held the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Fatima in his hands. And that this, for the first time in the history of our country, there is an honoring of Mary in the name of our country, in the name of the president. These are good signs. But what are they signs of? There are two sides of these signs. One side of the sign, Ecce Homo, behold the man. Here we make an error of, 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 of uh, Pilate. Behold the man. Yes, he is man. And he is as just as much a man as I am. He is just as much a man as any human being. He is man. But what are we supposed to see when we see that man? We see that this man is hypostatically united to God the Son. This man is the firstborn of all creation. This man is the head of the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ. This man is rightly called God. And this man rules. This man decides who goes up and who goes down. He's more than just a man. Even a good man. When the Antichrist comes, 
It will be said in the name of Satan, Ecce Homo, once again, Behold the man. But he will be a man who is only a man. And he will be worshipped as God. And this man who is God, Jesus Christ, Pilate says, Behold the man, a good man. Behold your king. Two mistakes of Pilate. One mistake is, he is a man, but he is not just a man. And the second is, your king. Your king. The Lord Jesus Christ is not your king. He's not my king. He is not our king. He is the king of all kings. He is the king of those that love him. He is the king of those that hate him. He is the king of those that do not care. And so they look upon him on Good Friday morning. And when it comes to 3 p.m., they look upon him again. Actually closer to 4 or 5 p.m. When they pierce the side of Christ and they look upon him whom they have pierced. Before they looked upon the man. He was even called king. And Pilate even said, Shall I crucify your king? I don't want to crucify your king. You know, there are many Pilates down the last 2,000 years since Jesus Christ was crucified. And there will be many Pilates until the end of time. And they will say, I don't want to crucify your king. I don't want to crucify a good man. And if you force me to crucify him, I'm going to wash my hands because I have no part in this crucifixion. And this is part of the lie of our age. The good men of our age are like unto Pilate. Every Republican knows that the only reason there's wickedness in the world is because the devil made a Democrat. And if it wasn't for Democrats, there would be no wickedness in the world. And how wonderful the world would be if there just wasn't a Hillary. <laughs> but the fact is, Hillary wasn't always around. There haven't always been Democrats. But the world has always been filled with sin. And it will be filled with sin until it's ending. Ecce homo. Ecce rex vester. Behold the man. Behold your king. This is a lie. We open our eyes and see only a man. And we do not see what he really is. And we claim that we don't have a part to play in his crucifixion. It's interesting how just a couple of weeks ago, Alex Jones, not even a Catholic, I'm not looking forward to the hard times ahead, he said. I'm not looking forward to the destruction of our country. But I admit, we deserve what we're going to get. We do deserve punishment. We do deserve the cross. We do deserve to lose all that we have. When the king of Nineveh recognized that, what happens? Jonas came into the city of Nineveh and he said, I'm going to destroy this city. God is going to destroy the city. But the king of Nineveh said, He's right. Our city deserves to be destroyed because of our sins. And the king of Nineveh then put sackcloth and ashes upon himself. And he commanded that everyone in Nineveh, from the king all the way down to the beasts, should do penance. And for 40 days they did penance. And God did not destroy Nineveh. Whereas Pilate, the representative of the king, he said, this man is innocent. Which is true. He is innocent. But why did Pilate fail? He failed because Pilate did not recognize Pilate's own guilt. Pilate did not repent for his own guilt. And we have to recognize in our situation, in our crisis today, we are guilty each one of us. 
And we are worthy of the collapse of our country. We are worthy of the collapse of our church. We are worthy of the mass being taken from us. We are worthy of the suffering and the chastisement. We are worthy of being thrown in FEMA camps. We are worthy of all the punishments that God may allow us to receive. Speak this truth and don't speak like Pilate. There were some soldiers at 5 o'clock that evening. These same soldiers were casting dice. They were throwing dice. Upon my vesture they cast lots. Because after all, there is this one seamless garment, and we normally cut everything up into four pieces to give each of the four soldiers at the foot of the cross. But this is a very valuable. We don't want to cut it apart, and so they cast lots. Upon his vesture they cast lots. Like Isaiah said they would do 800 years before that day, when four soldiers fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And upon his vesture they cast lots. And one of them was very happy because he got the vestment. That was his good day. But a few hours later, they saw Jesus Christ cry out with a loud voice and give up the ghost. And it was those soldiers that said, Indeed, he was the Son of God. It was the soldiers that began to recognize the truth. How could a man speak with such power in the midst of such pain? And here we must recognize, as our holy church is going through its crucifixion, we must also speak with power, as Christ spoke with power during his physical crucifixion. You must also cry out with a loud voice as he cried out. And then, they will, they will, after, after he has been dead, they shall pierce his side and out shall come blood and water and they will look upon him whom they have pierced. They call him a man. They call him your king. Pilate had written upon the head of the cross, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And Pilate and Caiaphas said, don't say that he really is a king, but rather change it to where he called himself a king. And Pilate said, quote, scripsy, scripsy, what I have written, I have written. He is a king, and he is truly a king, but he is not only the king of the Jews. And now it's five o'clock in the afternoon, and they don't know what he is. But they know he's not what they said he was. He's not just a man. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's not just another one that was put to death. And he is not just dead. For out came blood and water, and not only blood. They looked upon him, and they began to wonder, who is he? On the third day, he will show his power. And as he did 2,000 years ago, so he shall do again. He is going to show his power. We must say that he is not only man, a good man. We must say he is not only the king of the Catholics, not only the king of the Jews, but he is the king of kings and lord of lords. We must recognize his full dominion over all creation. His full dominion over the family. His full dominion over every part, every part of our lives. His full dominion over my work and over my recreation. His full dominion over every single aspect and part of society and part of the universe. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we go back to what was said in the book of Exodus. They will ask me, Who sent me to free the Jewish people? I'm going to go into Egypt and say, I have come from God. They will ask me, who sent you? And you will say to them, he who is sent you. He who is. I am who am. He who is. Those soldiers looked upon him. They looked upon he who is. And how is it that they began to be converted 
How is it that the redemption began to happen inside of them and then spread to the entirety of the angels and the entirety of the universe? Because they looked upon him whom they have pierced. We must recognize we are the ones who have pierced Jesus Christ's side. We are the ones who have taken a spear and plunged it into his heart. We are the ones that were not satisfied when he was already dead or is said already to be dead. We still pierce him. We get baptized in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. We receive the true faith, but we still commit sins. We still have to go to confession. And let's look upon him. And then what happens right after those soldiers look upon him? Simon the Cyrenian, or rather, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come to bury him. They come with the Blessed Virgin Mary. They come with St. John, who touched the sacred body of him. Where do we want to be when the church is said to be dead? When Christ is said to be destroyed? We want to be with him. We must recognize that we must go and carry the body of Christ. What is the most important thing to do when it is said that Jesus Christ is dead? Carry his body. They say his faith is dead. He is nailed to a tree and his faith is dead. What must we do? We must carry it. And this is the great work of our Jesus Marcel Lefebvre. We recognize in the crisis of the church, when the church appears to be dead, what is necessary? To form members of the holy mystical body of Christ, who you say Christ is dead, and he cannot move his own body. You say Christ is dead, and he can no longer speak words. You say Christ is dead, and he can no longer do anything. All right, go and demand his body. Go to the kings and demand his body. And then go and take his body and carry it with the Holy Mother to the place that they call the place of burial. And this place of burial, what's going to happen? An angel will come to that place and say, look at this beautiful place where they laid him. What's a saint? Who are the ones that will see God face to face? Those who carry the dead body of Jesus Christ to a tomb when he is despised. That's the purpose of the young adult gathering. That's the purpose of the seminary. That's the purpose of our holy work. We have our most number of young adults this year all together. We'll be about four, more than 40 of us when it's all said and done, 40 of us. What are we going to do? Carry Jesus Christ. When you get married, if any of you get married, a Catholic man, a Catholic woman, you come to the seminary, what will you do? Carry Jesus Christ. We will not be carrying the little baby that is so cute and so beautiful. We will be carrying the dead body. We'll be carrying to a tomb on a day that Jesus Christ seems to be defeated. And in a very short time, what will they say? An angel will come when the Blessed Virgin Mary has her victory and say, Look at the place where they laid him. My father, Urban Snyder, back in the 1970s and 80s, used to stand here at this place in this pulpit, the old Trappist monk. And he said, one day, his fingers always pointed, bending, one day you will see that this little place of the Holy Land of Kentucky, this little place here will have a part to play in the restoration of our Holy Church. And that's what he used to say here 40 years ago. We must have that part to play. How do you restore the church? They said he's dead. Now, what happened when Jesus Christ died? It tells us what happened. There were many people there at the Good Friday, at that cross, and what did they do? They went home, striking their breasts. That's what they did. 
they let home strike in their breasts, for there was an earthquake. There were great signs and wonders. And to shame what they did to him. They went home striking their breasts. What happened to them? I don't know. But there were some following Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, and following Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a coward. And some with Joseph and Nicodemus went to Pilate and said, we're not going home. We're not even going home striking our breasts. We are going to where Jesus Christ is dead. We are going where His body has been abandoned on the tree. And we are going to carry Him to a tomb. And the mother wants us to do it. Now the mother of God loves all men. But do you think she will ever forget who carries the dead body of her son? It is always good to have a Catholic family. It is always good to be a Catholic priest. It is always good to love God. But what about when he's dead? What about when the whole world says it's finished and it's over and some are rejoicing with Caiaphas because he's dead and others are going home striking their breasts because it's over and he's dead. But there is a third group. Is he dead? Where is the body? It's on a cross. I demand the body. And they take down the body. And notice also concerning this group, there is a time of urgency. They don't have a lot of time. Because the Sabbath is upon them. And not just the Sabbath, but the great Sabbath. They don't have time to properly complete the burial. Remember the night before, Holy Thursday night? St. Augustine mentions this. Remember the night before? Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Holy Thursday night, Judas, what thou must do, do quickly. Now it was Thursday night. Judas must quickly go and betray Christ. That was the night of the speed of Judas. But Friday night, is the night of the speed of Joseph of Arimathea and the speed of Nicodemus and the speed of St. John for now what they must do they must do quickly if they don't go right now to, command, to, to, to demand the body of Christ it shall be abandoned if they don't go right now and take him down from the cross they have only a small amount of time they don't have time to buy all the myrrhs and aloes they don't have the time to complete the burial and fulfill all the customs. They must move with haste. Yes, it is true. The enemies of God move with haste when it comes to crucifying Him. The friends of God move with haste when it comes to carrying Him to the tomb. They move with haste when it comes to taking Him down from the cross. What is it that a priest of God is supposed to do? What is it that the Catholic is supposed to do when he sees that someone is in need? With haste, he must do something. The priest of God walked by a man bleeding on the side of the road. And so did the Levite. But the Samaritan, who is Jesus Christ, when he walked by, with haste, this man is bleeding. His body cannot walk on his own two feet. He must be carried. And he quickly carried him up. He quickly brought him to the to, to the to the to the end. And he paved the way. It is most urgent to carry the dead body of Christ into the next generation. And what does that mean? 
we must have priests who will preach the word of God when God is said to be dead. Nietzsche said 150 years ago, God is dead. And their diggers are coming to bury his grave. Who will speak of God when he is said to be dead? They look upon him whom they have pierced. They knew all about him before he was dead. They knew all the gossip. They knew all the accusations. They knew there were so many words. But now they see this dead body. He's not a criminal. He's not an ordinary dead man. There is beauty and sacredness in his dead body. It is the will of God that the only real picture that we have of Jesus Christ as he really looked is the body of Jesus Christ after three days in the tomb. After the third day of the tomb, a light filled the shroud of Turin and it impressed the face of Jesus Christ in a photograph, the first photograph that was ever taken in history, 2,000 years ago, of the face of Jesus Christ, dead. And it was the will of God that all artists will paint the, re the representation of Jesus Christ according to that image. The image of the dead Jesus Christ. The world will always say that He is dead. Who will carry the dead man? Who will pull the nails out of the cross? Who will carry Him to a tomb? It's urgent. Nowadays, you notice many of you are irritated with many modern couples. When you get married, get married. I like the Indian way. Arrange marriage, get married, move on with life. We do need Catholic marriages. We need babies. We need marriages in Christ. And we need vocations in Christ. It is urgent to bring Christ who is said to be dead to carry the dead Christ throughout our entire world for he cannot move during those three days. What will the angels say at the end of time when all those on the right side of Jesus Christ, who are they? They are those that have laid Jesus Christ in the tomb. They are those that carried him at the command and the presence of his holy mother. This is a most sacred time. Let us know, love, and serve God in our age. Let's have Catholic families in our age. Let's spread the Holy Roman Catholic faith in our age. And let us not claim innocence like Pilate did, but rather have the wisdom, the wisdom of the King of Nineveh, who blamed himself for the sins of himself and his people, did not follow the ways of Pilate, who says it's a problem of the Democrats. No, our country is guilty of sin and worthy of punishment. But what can happen by the power of that one Hail Mary? We can receive a reprieve. The Blessed Virgin can go easy on us in the punishment that we deserve as a country. Because our president stood in the presence of Mary while the singing of the Ave Maria for the first time in the history of our country. We can be sorry. We can call upon the Blessed Virgin to give us a reprieve. And we accept whatever comes our way. And no matter what it is that comes, let us carry Jesus Christ. Don't go home and strike your breasts. And definitely don't be like the foolish Caiaphas who rejoiced as the veil of the temple was destroyed from top to bottom, as Caiaphas lost his priesthood, as Caiaphas prepared himself for eternal damnation, and the fool rejoiced that Jesus Christ was dead. And in that death, Caiaphas and his master Satan were defeated. Don't be a fool like the Satanists that follow Caiaphas. 
And don't be a fool like those that go home striking their breasts waiting for better times. But rather, be a fool like St. Paul and carry the dead body of Christ to the place of holy burial. And an angel will protect us. And the Blessed Virgin will be with us. And victory shall be ours on the third day. Let us establish Catholic families, Catholic vocations, Catholic everything, and God will bless us until the ending of our days. I do that bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And tonight we have the only adoration for the young adults over there. There's sheep in the back of the church to sign up for each of the hours during the all-night adoration. Tomorrow morning, the Mass at 8 o'clock, the benediction of the Mass at 8 o'clock, and then afterwards, breakfast, and then we will go into the, uh, load up the bus and head into the city of, of Louisville tomorrow, visiting a few places, and then uh, and then we'll cross over the river, and then uh, then we'll come back, and then on Sunday, of course, the mass will be at 10 a.m. and then we'll also head out again on Sunday. I'm going to give a close echo to you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And after the 